Can I tell you something which really annoys me? And I don't know oh, if I'll be able I don't know if I'll be able to make this point succinctly enough, but I'll try. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> yeah, uh, anyone listening who uh, may be a future employer, please please turn off now. <laughs> <laughs> but it really annoys me. You have all these people who, you know, they profess these political ideologies, whether it be the Thatcherite way of thinking or, you know, the socialistic type of thinking. And these are mostly middle, upper middle class people. And they seem to get to, they seem to arrive at these ideas through um, reading books and theory. Yeah, through but theory. Much, yeah, but, but, but much of them... real life. But much of them haven't actually lived a lot of life, which gets you the experience you really need to understand what would be a good way of running the country. Yeah, and I know exactly I, that. that. That's uh, certainly true. And there's, there's, there is always that argument between, you know, do, uh, do we need more theorists or do we need more, you know, pra pragmatic real people, you know? But, but what frustrates me is um, I work with a lot of working class people as you would tend to find as an electrician and i tend to find they almost always have exactly the same views great ones which i have uh, when it comes to immigration eu i don't know anyone um who i've worked with who has voted to stay in the eu um they believe in uh, a certain amount of spending and state control so they support things like um nationalizing the trains um, and to me, this is all common sense stuff. Um, but for, for the people who tend to be running these think tanks and running being MPs and everything, they, they arrive at these ideas without actually understanding them properly. Um, and they, they basically intellectualize everything. And what well, I really well, like about I, I, think, I think certainly, Damien, I, I actually, no, I, I, would, I would disagree with that only on the point that they don't arrive to it they don't arrive to it incompletely or incorrectly. They arrive to it exactly how they they arrive to it in in almost a in almost a perfect manner. They sort of arrive to it in a ah yes in a perfect world this would work, you know. And and I and I always see it's it always really annoys me when you see you know young Tories and and young young uh, libertarians online that say well well communism only works on paper but it doesn't work in real life I'm like yes and your ideology also doesn't work in real life it also <laughs> only works on paper like go out into the real world be pragmatic see how people live and you would maybe reconsider some of yeah. the points that you have on 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 this because some some long dead economist from 150 years ago and the, you know, and and you could much as easily apply that to where uh, Adam was it Adam Smith as you could apply it to Marx. You know, mm -hmm. those two guys really didn't see the outside world. You know, they really didn't they really didn't go out and uh, and and live a, a normal working class life. They did their own things, and they and they came to it through theory. And yes, of course, someone who studies theory all day can be right. No one's saying that theory is always wrong. What we are saying is maybe a bit more pragmatism, a bit less, a bit less, you know, you know, clinging to 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 theoretical ideas. Maybe it's not always the right thing to do, you know. Well, it's like George Orwell. George Orwell very much lived in the thick of it uh, and experienced things, and that's what made him such a good writer. And he very much rejected communism after being broadly supportive of the communists in the Spanish Civil War. But um, he came to realise that um, what they were fighting for wasn't actually what um, would benefit society. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to argue, basically, is that I want us to escape ideology and political ideologies in general and move back to a way of thinking which is more just natural to how we feel. I feel like the train should be nationalised because... At the moment, the uh, prices are very expensive. Uh, and, you know, I feel like immigration should be lowered because I feel like it's changing our culture too rapidly. And I think if we feel more and not intellectualize so much, I think we'll yeah. actually arrive at a better place. You know, I, I think that's a good point as well, because a lot of these, a lot of these, you know, e e conservatives and things. You know, they often they often go for the very uh, the very cringe Shapiro argument of, uh, sorry, but facts don't care about your feelings. 
And it's like, sorry, idiot, but people <laughs> feel things, but people have emotions, and you yourself do not operate purely on how you and how on yeah. raw facts and logic. You also operate on emotional thinking. It's like, sorry, the average person doesn't give a shit about your very specific, very uh, theoretical and niche ideology. They care about how they feel about about how about how the world is changing around them. They do care about that. And you know, and I think I think politicians, politicians uh, who understand that are very far and few between. But those who do tend to do very well. You know, it's you know we you know and, and through the looking glass, you might say oh, that person was a bad that person was a bad person or that person was an excellent person. But at the end of the day, if you get a party which understands public mood and understands how people feel. You would certainly, you would certainly uh, be living in a different, in a different society now. You know, heck, e- even even on things like uh, the death penalty, if you asked, if you had a referendum tomorrow on the death penalty, you know, you it, it would be brought back tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? Like p- because people objectively support it. Do you know? Do, do you see what I mean? And there are, you know, there are lots of there there are lots of politicians who I feel quite 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 foolishly cling to theory and theory and uh and and books and and arguments and never never see the world for how it is anyway anyway yeah exactly anyway. Can, can, before we before we finish this can i can i give you one great quote which i think sums up exactly what i'm trying to say christopher go on go on, go on, go on big man you go for it so this is from robert kaplan he's he's not really right wing he's probably more, more considered left wing actually and he, he says, the very economic success for decades upon decades in Europe and the USA that produced a class of people who are both financially secure and physically secure. They were the first generation or two in history that didn't have to worry about their survival, whether economical, economic or physical. They were cushions, they were pre- protected, they were ahistorical in other words, and therefore they lived with philosophy rather than with history. And philosophy has all these beautiful theories about peace and democracy, the whole pantheon. History is for those who have had bad experiences in life. And so you have a generation that in a technocratic sense is very well equipped, very competent, very well equipped, but they don't have the judgment from actually living through hard times. And that's what I'm trying to get out with my politics. <laughs> oh, that's a very, uh, that's a very, uh, uh, very interesting statement. I'm sure that our viewers at home will be a uh, will be thinking about that. No, that, that that's very that's very well summarised. I appreciate that. But um, it's true. It's true. History is for the people who have had bad experiences, and these are the people you want to run your country. In my in my opinion, <laughs> the, the the doomers. You want the you want the <laughs> doomers to take power. The do- <laughs> Uh, yeah, Damien, Damien, I I, I believe uh, you wanted to speak a little bit about uh, an article which Simone had written. Do you still want to do that? Yes, I do. I'm actually. I will. I will. I will, I will give you to the floor. Then I will. I will try and. Uh, I will try and input a bit less on this one. I'll let, <laughs> let you guys just run with it. Because Simone okay. still is a co-host. Please, <laughs> <laughs> she's not a guest. <laughs> Okay, well, in that case, I'll address it to you, Simone. Okay, hello. Um, I was really interested to read your article because uh, you touched on something which I think is not often uh, written about in any sort of real depth. And it is this, what you talk about as the hookup culture and how we've sort of moved into a society where people aren't really going out and mingling in the same way we used to quite often people connect now online and online dating, apparently something like uh, a third of all relationships come out of online dating these days. It's probably higher. And I just think there is like a romance being lost from this experience. And I don't actually think it's very good for society as well, because I think that it leads to sort of more, um, surface level type of relationship that people get involved in and i don't think these are the greatest environments to bring children into the world into um and yeah and please interrupt me whenever whenever you want because i'll just carry on otherwise <laughs> um no well, well i agree with you obviously before i before we carry on can you actually 
before we carry on, uh, Simone, maybe you'd like to actually tell the folks at home what your article is called and, and, and what it is. Um, what it what was it called? Um, oh, it was. I I, rem- I remember thinking of it, and I was like, you know what? I want I want a title with some alliteration at this time. I never I never get it in. So it was hinge hedonism and hook and uh, hookup culture. So I was asking whether the twenty first century was you know killing romance, and for for a lot of the time, I think it is. Um, so I'm trying to remember how I started it. So it started into it. So I'd actually been talking to a few people about their experiences on dating apps. Um, and I don't know what it was. I could just never really wrap my head around it. There was nothing attractive about it to me. I couldn't think of anything that seemed cheaper than just meeting someone on, on an app. And it just, the whole concept has just always seemed so shallow to me, you know, It's just, it seems really distasteful that you can download an app within a few seconds and flick through it for a couple of minutes and be able to, you know, to some people, find love based on a momentary glance at your phone. And it's, you know, 90% of it is looking at someone and making a split second decision purely based on how they look. And I mean, some people could argue that in the real world, you know, it is like that you know you see someone and you strike a conversation but you know in the real world you meet people you meet people organically and you know nothing's forced and it's it's a lot more natural and this it just seems really cheap to me because in real life you can't practice this sort of thing you have flaws you have you know the stutters and the coffee spillings and I know that sounds really cliche and silly I love actually but- type moment <laughs> yeah but but at the same time it's not you know there are you know when you text people you have delete buttons and nothing happens as naturally as it would in the in the real world and it just I don't know it takes away our ability to just communicate with people on a normal level as well and also that there's just I can't wrap my head around the idea of you know a few years time you're sat with your kids and they ask you oh how did you how did you how did you and dad me and i'm like oh you know tinder <laughs> it's just something that really uh, that and but as for hookup culture i mean it's not i, I couldn't say in the article and i couldn't say now either that hookup culture is just sort of spawned from apps and stuff i mean it's been around for a long time but it's increasing of course um but you know we've had like um what's it clubbing culture that's it you know so you know people meet and like 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 on an app they see each other and they make a decision and they try and you know take that person home and do the stuff but you know, do the deed just, yeah well do rude things i don't know it was just yeah you know people just casually having sex and stuff and you know really stripping it of its meaning and what it should be you know should be a bond between two people that love each other not something that's just cheap and easy and and i mean even today like a commodity you know that's what sex is something you can just pick up yeah. and look at and it just it's one of those things that just really saddens me <laughs> yeah and I, I think I think Instagram in particular has been really bad for the female species. <laughs> um, wait, wait, because... uh, would you say, Damien, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, hookup culture and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race? <laughs> I swear down, we're we're going to get a different version of that quote in every single episode now. <laughs> um, yes, I do. Um, and. Yeah, there's something about, um, but what I wanted to touch on actually is that I feel like as a society, we're actually getting to the point where there's fewer places in which people actually meet and have casual conversation. I, I, I tend to find that it's more becoming um, people who work with each other and things like this. And 
funnily enough, I have actually used Tinder in the past, and so I can actually speak from experience. Um, I, I sort of caught, I, I caught on to it in, a, in its early days. And I have to say something which is really bizarre, right, is I've actually tried to approach um, people who I don't know at, at, at a bar or something like that and try to speak to them. And quite often the, the reaction I get is quite um, almost hostile because it's like you're trying to break into their group circle. Um, and it, that's quite an odd thing, I think. Whilst on Tinder, it's almost the opposite. People are like much more open and it's very easy to strike up a conversation. And I think that's probably partly to do with uh, British culture as well and the way we're moving. I think oh. British people in general are quite socially inept and I find that a bit frustrating. Well, um, Damien, if you ever approached me in a bar, I would not be hostile. So, <laughs> Jeez, keep, keep guys, going. get a room. <laughs> Jesus. Keep, keep going, keep trying. This I'm is sure the Simple Ads podcast, not the Find a Boyfriend podcast, all right? <laughs> all right, anyway, carry on. But um, I'd, I'll tell you something which I was quite a revelation for me. Um, and I, I get made fun of for doing this. Uh, um, I have been made fun of in the past. Is that I actually took up um, salsa dancing and Latin dancing uh, a few years ago. You mentioned that. You mentioned that before. I was, I was going to ask about that. <laughs> Yeah, so I had this um, ex-girlfriend from years ago and um, her mum was Colombian and she had her cousins come and do salsa in the living room once. And I thought, oh, that's cool. Um, and then I found <laughs> out there was there were some salsa dancing classes local to me. And I went along and it's this old school building where it's like um, a really nice sort of wooden bar and everything. It's like straight from the 1970s. Um, but there was something really old school and charming about it. Uh, so you go in and you have your lessons and you do it in a circle and then everyone has like a party afterwards and you dance with each other. And the music isn't thumping loud, so it's not like David Guetta blasting in your ears. <laughs> you sit down at a table, um, you'll have a drink and you'll talk with people and you will you can go up to any girl you want and you'll say, do you want to dance? And you'll dance with that girl. And then you dance with them, maybe you'll have a chat and maybe go have a drink together. And this is just not what happens in nightclubs in Britain or in bars in Britain. And there was just something really traditional and old school and endearing about it. And I think I remember interviewing someone years ago, like an old man at a bench who was like in his 80s. And I was actually doing a comedy sketch because I did like um, a thing with my friend where we would like do funny interviews and things. And he actually said, well, I met one, my wife dancing. Of course, you young people, you don't go dancing anymore. And he's right. We don't go dancing anymore. I'm often, I'm often, uh, I am often endeared by, uh, by stories of my, my, my grandparents met at a dance, I believe. And uh, my other grandparents, they, you know, they would also, in Hull, uh, where I live, um, we have a, it's closed down now. It's very depressing. It's closed down now. It's this really, really large uh department store and it's this huge building right in the middle of hull and it's derelict and it's it's been it's been abandoned for for years and years you know this place is falling down basically um and whenever we would drive past it when i was younger my granddad would always would always point up at it and talk about how the very top floor of this department store is just one big dance hall and it has like a really good, and it's it's still in there. It's still in, it's just abandoned, but it's still in there. It has a a beautiful like a springboard floor, which is you know what they used for like uh like you know waltzes and 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 Latin style dancing and all that jazz. And I and I think wow, we we'll never get that ever again. That's it. That you know that that that's not coming back anytime soon. And the only place. The only place you can sort of find it now is in clubs and groups, and you can't really, you know, no one normally one takes it out dancing anymore unless it's to a club or something, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's a real it's shame. Sweet. Yeah, it's a real shame because um, when I discovered this, for me, it was it was so great, and I really really got to love it. And I ended up going to parties in London and things like this. And uh, it's quite funny actually when you do Latin dance because. I'm actually quite experienced now, so I actually consider myself to be relatively good. 
but when I go to London, I'm dancing with like South American girls and I'm totally shit compared to them. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> no, it's still Please. nice though. It's it's comfy though. It's it's nice. Uh, you know, it's. It, I think it's good to. I think it's good to be able to do one thing. Like for me, for example, I'm. I waltz, and everyone is so shocked to hear that. But I I waltz. I used to waltz quite a lot. Um, I was taught. Uh, I was taught at school. Um, by one of my teachers because he, he he put on like a class for people who are interested or I, I will show you how to waltz if you want to and you know a, a few of us joined a few of us joined um and it literally was just waltzing and you know and and dancing and things and i i ended up you know i end i end up every single time there's ever an event or something happens one of my friends like some some a group of people will be, you know, trying to do some form of dancing or whatever. And one of them will say, oh, Chris, you, you know how to waltz, don't you? you Show us how to waltz, Chris. And you just get these really quite nice, you know, nice moments of, oh, yeah, I'll show you how I'll show you all to waltz. And about, you know, 10 Aww. or 20 people are all gathered around and I'm just teaching them how to waltz. And they're all and they're all terrible because waltzing is actually quite hard. <laughs> but, yeah, it's... um. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not good. I'm not good at it or anything, but I know, I know the basics to it. Um, mm. But yeah, no, it's, it's always, it's always quite good to, uh, to, to, to have that, you know, and to do those things. Simone was gushing at the idea of you waltzing. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I just well, think it's really cute and sweet, and you know, not enough people do it. So you two both keep, keep dancing, and hopefully one I, day. I, <laughs> your favor <laughs> <laughs> I, I think i think what i think what puts a lot of people off doing some form of dancing like that is they have this idea of strictly come dancing which is actually the most ridiculous form of dancing ever because it's just totally show dancing it's not real dance whatsoever um and what i like about latin dance in particular i'm talking about salsa bachata and kazomba which are the ones i do is they're much more casual because this is what everyone does in South America or a lot of people in South America do. And so it's not stiff, but at the same time, it is quite traditional. And I've, I've taken this from someone else, but I do actually really like this. There's something very traditional about salsa dancing in particular, where you're leading the woman and you're making her do whatever you want her to do. All right, calm, all right, hang on, all right. <laughs> calm down there, big guy. Purely, purely consensual dancing only, please, all right? Wow. Purely, uh, purely uh, uh, friendly dancing only, please, all right? Yes. <laughs> but, but, but at the same time, it's your job, in a way, to, to show her off and also protect her. Yeah, we her. always, our, um, our dance teacher, actually, to... to to agree with that point, it's in 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 some. I think I, I think I can word it a bit, maybe a bit less uh, <laughs> wacky, <laughs> maybe, maybe a bit less uh, forward than you, Damien. We are, our teacher always used to say, our our teacher at school used to say, "You are you are like a wall, you are like oh, a nice. wall." No, 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 no. Listen, this is sounding like communism. He always used to say, he always used to say, "You are like a wall, and the woman you are dancing with is like a painting." And you, you know, she is, she is hung on you. She is, she is what is being, so yes, you, you are the one who leads with the steps, but she's the one everyone is looking at. She's the one that people care about. You know, it's hair moves, it's hair dancing, it's, it's hair dance. You are merely, you know, there to provide that, that uh, motion. You are there to, to lead in the dance. Um, and of course, and of course, you know, there are plenty of, you know there are plenty of uh, of uh, uh, female dancers who do lead uh, and who do uh, reverse the roles. And I'm not saying I'm not saying oh female dancers can't lead. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm just saying it because you know obviously you know, obviously they can. But when you are dancing in a in a purely traditional sense in a in a like a, in a competition or something, you know you are. And it, it's the reason why it's the reason why male dancers when they're doing. Uh, like waltzing or salsa, will all basically wear the same clothes. Do you know what I mean? They will all basically wear the same style of clothes. In waltzing, it's you know just like a it's like a, a morning jacket or an evening jacket, long tails, 
uh, and a uh, and suit and tie basically but the woman will wear whatever she wants to be a beautiful dress or something um no so there there is something to be said about that um that's how we always used to frame it yeah yeah well you should see my salsa dancing outfit is composed of a <laughs> nice blue shirt white <laughs> t-shirt underneath a nice big jesus cross i i very much go for the puerto rican gangster look <laughs> <laughs> Very cool, very cool. Well, epic. Is there anything else anyone wants to talk about? Um, big up the Catholic Church, maybe. Whoa, a, re- a, a, a very hard statement there from Damien. Edgy, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, if that's everything, uh, thank you all for listening at home. This has been the Simple As Podcast, episode two, uh, featuring uh, my lovely guest co host, Simone. Uh, who who will at some point will at some point and she has agreed to this when this yes. when this podcast when this podcast reaches 100 subscribers uh, we are going to do a 100 subscriber special in which anyone will be able to call in and you'll be able to ask Simone any question you want uh, <laughs> any wow. question you any want. question you want uh, you know, and that's for anyone it'll, it'll be a, it'll be a pre it'll be a pre arranged. Uh, as to who comes in, which obviously it's quite hard to do a call on Discord, and I'm not putting my phone number out on Twitter. <laughs> but, uh, but no, we're, we are we are going to be doing a, a call-in special. So thank you, thank you very much to Simone for volunteering to help tonight. Um, next it's next episode, team. next episode will 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 be returning. Um, like I say, he had work today and therefore couldn't come on. Uh, so a big thank you to Simone for helping out. And a very big thank you to Damien from Purple Tories for coming along. Um, thank you very much. Say, we, may, we may not agree on everything. And I think that I think that's, uh, some, of, some of Damien's points are a bit uh, wacky, and a, bit, a, 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 <laughs> bit, a bit loopy, someone might say, a bit, a bit cuckoo. But uh, no, he's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you both on. And uh, obviously, I look forward to, look forward to putting this out and uh, seeing the reaction we get. So for one last time, Thank you very much from me. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all on the next episode of the Simple As Podcast. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye.